Okay, so how is everyone today? It's not on. No. Okay, so last time we were talking about derivative. And uh, the definition of derivative is a little weird, uh, at least in comparison to the definition of derivative that you may have been formerly accustomed to. Um, uh, for those of you that are math majors, and, and many of you who are physics majors, you, you may come to find that you'll think back on the definition of derivative that you learned for functions that take reals to reals and think, oh no, it's actually that one, that's the weird one. Okay. So what's today the 28th? It's not really that it's the weird one, it's that, is that uh, in the case of scalars, a scalar is a vector, right, in the, in the case of, of scalars. And because you can divide by scalars, that means that you can divide by vectors when you interpret a scalar to be a vector, an increment. So that's why it works out so nice the definition of derivative that you knew and also why our definition that we had to go that we had to you know construct last time looks so weird because in the end you couldn't just replace division by h a scalar with division by h a vector because division by a vector is not defined so we had to go through all of these contortions to get it to work out okay the good news is one well not really but I'll just tell you that part, there, there is some news, and that is that in other algebraic systems, it is perfectly reasonable to divide by a vector. And then the definition of derivative is exactly the same <laughs> that you already knew. OK, but not, not here and not now. OK, so we talked about the derivative. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and write down just that limit so we can remember it. It was the limit as vector h goes to uh, the origin, 1 over length of h. And then we got to put some stuff in there. Some stuff goes in there. And then this is all supposed to be equal to what? Zero. Zero. Okay, we got to put some stuff in there. Okay, so what goes in there? Mm -hmm. So if the point in question where we're trying to compute the derivative is A, I, I usually call it A for anchor. Anyway, that's how it is in my head. Uh, F of A plus H, and then minus F of A. This is how the function changes from the anchor. So if you move, a, if you move a, an increment H from the anchoring point A, this is how the function changes. Then, then what else do we need? minus m of h. And what's supposed to, what, what is m of h supposed to be? m is supposed to be a linear function. So m is a linear function. of h. So if you can solve for m, if, 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 if you can solve for m, then the function is said to be differentiable there. OK. So one thing I want you to note is that f, if, if this is what f does, if f uh, maps rn to rm, if that's what f does, really, remember the, the precise definition is that the anchor point A has to be located within, within an open set, which is a subset of Rn. So there's, there's a few details I'm omitting. But if F has this signature, then what, what signature does M have? The identical signature. It must. Because what you're saying, 
What you're saying is that it is like you're saying, oh, well, if you were a little bitty creature walking around on the surface, on the surface, in quote, scare quotes, on the object defined by the graph of M, and if the function is differentiable there, then for a little creature, you could, without them noticing, replace F with M. You could do that. And in order to make that replacement, surely they'd have to have the same kinds of inputs and outputs. It would be just like saying, if you were walking around on the plane in Kansas, okay, and we are, in fact, little bitty creatures in comparison to the Earth, then in principle it should be possible to replace the Earth with a flat thing and no one would notice. Unless you, unless you got really far away. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So any question about, uh, about just reminding you about the definition of derivative? So now this definition is a bit unwieldy. It's a bit unwieldy when you're trying to, you know, when you try to imagine, well, if, if, if I were given a function, how would, I, how would I compute it? So what was the very next, how would I compute the derivative given a function? What was the very next thing we defined? The Jacobian. The Jacobian. And we didn't say it explicitly, but but implicitly we kind of said this is what it is. So let's, let's remember what the Jacobian is. So given such an F, please remind me, what is the Jacobian of F at A? So in the first place it's a matrix, right? It's a matrix. And we defined it one column at a time. So what's the first column? Right. It's the derivative with respect to the first variable of the function at the anchor. So if, we, if the function was a, was a function of x and y, this first column would be all with respect to x, partial derivatives with respect to x. And then the next column, d2. F at A, and then finally, so what's the last column? So I heard, I, heard, I think I heard three different answers. I heard N, I heard M, and I also thought I heard K. <laughs> <laughs> so now I heard them both again. I heard M and N. What, so what are, what are we differentiating with respect to? The, we're, this is differentiation with respect to the first variable, differentiation with respect to the second variable. How many variables are there? N. Okay, because there's N variables, there's N inputs. This one is differentiate, this first column is differentiation with respect to first input, last column is differentiation with respect to last input. Okay, <laughs> then what is, the, what is the, the shape, the rows and columns of this matrix, assuming that? Right, so it will be M rows and N columns. Because remember, matrix multiplication, the input size is that one and the output size is that one. Okay, so just to bring you back to that, how about, let's consider f of x, uh, y, and z is equal to something mildly entertaining, x squared, y, plus, uh, say, the logarithm of z. Okay, so I want you to compute the Jacobian of f. But in the first place, before we even do that, I'd like for you to tell me what, what is the signature of f? What kind of thing does, is input and what kind of thing is output? R3 to what? To r, right? A, a, a vector with three components is inputted, a scalar is outputted. So it's R3 to r. R3 to r. I don't mean that you can plug in any old R3, right, because, of, because there's a restriction on the domain of Z. I just mean that the kind of thing you plug in is a vector with three components. So this is like R3 to R. 
As a result, the Jacobian is going to be a matrix. What kind of matrix? It's going to be one. I'll go ahead and write the implied one there. It's going to be one by three, which is also known as a row instead of a column. So now let's calculate it. The Jacobian of f, x, y, and z. So what goes in the first column? 2xy. What goes in the second column? x squared. And what goes in the third column? 1 over z. <coughs> Any question about this? So now I'm going to wait for it. Because usually this is where some student wants to say, I'm not comfortable with this. So here's an f. We've computed its derivative. The derivative is a row. It's a row. Am I not going to get any bites this semester? Should it be a column? <laughs> Thank you for, my, for, the, for the pity bite. I'll play the <laughs> well, OK, so if you, if you took 24, 15, and 19, then you probably heard about this thing called the gradient, right? And the gradient, gradient wants to, you know, in, in 24, 15, and 19, whether or not the inputs were columns or rows was more or less just overlooked. It just wasn't talked about, usually. At, at least that's the way it's usually done. I, I didn't actually teach any of you 24, 15, or 19. Okay, so then, but at any rate, at any rate, at any rate, the, the gradient, the input and the output, um, need to be the same. They either need to both be rows or they need to both be columns. Right? If, you, if, if, if in 2415 you were dealing with row vectors, then, then the gradient necessarily was a row. If you're dealing with column vectors, the gradient necessarily was a column. But our inputs are columns. And our outputs are rows. So can you see? Oh, wait. Something's weird. Something strange here. So is this the gradient? It is not. It is not the gradient. So notably, this is not the gradient of f at x, y, and z. By and large, we're going to avoid the discussion of the gradient altogether because the gradient only makes sense since when you have dot product. Now, I don't have anything against dot product. But it took a long time in, in the history of mathematics to figure out, oh, this result actually depends on the dot product. And that one doesn't. So when you have a result that doesn't depend on the dot product, that, that result is considered to be a stronger result. So if you, can, if, you can, if you can get it without dot product, that's great. Okay, so then what, what we're going to be talking about, by and large, is going to not depend on the dot product. So the reason why you want to avoid the dot product is because it, 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 it imports a lot of baggage into, your, into the thoughts and, and implications about what you're talking about. Specifically, what dot product does is it's talking about, the, it, it defines for you angles. So the way angles are defined is in terms of the dot product. It's not the other way around. So if you're in a vector space and you insist that you have a dot product, that means that it, you insist that it makes, it makes sense for you to measure the angles between vectors. So here's an example where, so some examples just really do make sense, like trajectories of balls flying through the air. It, angles make sense. But if we were talking about uh, vectors whose components were, say, the stock prices of the Fortune 500 companies, okay, so then we have, we have vectors that have 500 components, you know, the, the, the one, the next one, all the way down. But these are vectors with 500 components. However, I don't, I don't think anyone can argue that it makes any sense to talk about the angle between the vectors 
of stock prices for Fortune 500 companies. It doesn't make any sense. So if, you're, if that's what you're talking about, then you need to avoid the, the use of the dot product because you, you probably will be making a mis mistake somehow. Okay, good. <clears throat> now that I hope I've warned you <laughs> against the, the dot product. One thing though, since y'all are math majors, does anyone know how to pronounce this? Nabla. Nabla. Yeah, Nabla. But here, here that's, that's good. But now let's get really esoteric. Do you know why it's called Nabla? Ah, he knows. <laughs> Nabla means harp, and I forget which language. Do you know? I think, it's, I think it may be Hebrew, but I don't really know. So Nabla means harp. Little harp. <clears throat> okay. So. <clears throat> now we need to determine the connection. We need to determine the connection between the Jacobian and the derivative. So here's the theorem. Let U, a subset of Rn, be open. A, an element of U. F from U to Rm. So this is the standard, this is the standard prelude to saying anything about a limit, anything that includes a limit. Uh, if the derivative of f at a exists. So if the derivative exists, that means that if it is in principle possible, if you can solve that equation uh, involving the m on the previous page, then we're going to write the solution in that way. And if the solution exists, then in the first place, it is unique. So if a function has a derivative at a point, then it has exactly that derivative at, at a point and, and not another one. And two, so df, df at a is a linear function. But one of the results from linear algebra is that every linear function is representable using a matrix. And the next statement is that the matrix of the matrix representation of the derivative of f at that point is exactly the Jacobian. So if the derivative exists, it is unique, and the matrix representation of the derivative is given by the Jacobian. Good. So now, let's, uh, let's <coughs> prove this. <coughs> let's prove it. So suppose <coughs> we found M. That is to say, we've solved for M. And I'm going to write M instead of DF at A, because otherwise the notation gets a little bit out of hand. So how do you, if you have a linear function M, how do you figure out its matrix? <coughs> For, yeah, so how can you figure out the first column? Plug in the first basis vector. How do you figure out the second column? Second basis vector, etc. Okay, so we're going to proceed exactly like this. We're going to say, well, what would happen if we plugged in the ith basis vector? What would happen? Okay. <coughs> uh, well, let's evaluate M. At EI. At the ith basis vector where I is between... Uh, one and n. Okay, so let's plug that in. <clears throat> so in particular, the limit 
Uh, hold on, I have to think about this for just a second. Having a brain issue. Okay. <clears throat> so the limit as uh, as T E I goes to zero. So we're going to specifically let we're going to just travel along this one particular basis vector. So this isn't this isn't a general H. This is this is a specific H. And it makes fine sense for us to choose a specific H. Why does it make fine sense for us to choose a specific H? It, so what I, what I mean is that to compute the derivative at A, this limit has to exist for every H. That's what it means for the derivative to exist. So why is it okay for us to select a specific H? Because we're, now we're approaching the origin very specifically. Yeah, because it exists. So this is part of the, this is part of the hypothesis. So, so it's, le it's legitimate to say, well, we're not going to just travel along any H. Let's, let's choose a specific one. OK. That's what my brain was thinking about for a minute. <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> is that OK? All right. So 1 over H. And then we'll do f of a plus t e i t e i <clears throat> minus f of a, and then minus m evaluated at e i. And this should be equal to zero. This limit, and it is equal to zero because we're, the hypothesis is that the limit exists. Okay, so now this right here would give us the first, the ith column of m. It would give us the ith column of m. And what we want to do is we want to uh, deal with this. So, how can we simplify this expression here? Okay. T comes out as what? As absolute value of T, right? Because these bars are, are these bars absolute value bars? <laughs> They're magnitude bars, right? They're vector magnitude. But the T can come out. And if the T comes out, it comes out as 1 over absolute T. And then we have 1 over magnitude EI, and then we have F of A plus TEI minus F of A minus the ith column of M. Okay, now how about this? What is that? So th that specifically, that's one. Why is that one? It's the standard basis, right? Length one. So we can drop that. So now we have one over absolute t. column of M. And now, I'd really like to get rid of the absolute value around the T. Is that, is that a permissible thing to do? Sorry? Well, I agree that, I agree that the absolute value of T is the square root of T squared. I agree. But what I want to do I'm going to write it, and I want, I want someone to confidently tell me why it's OK. Exactly. 
We couldn't do that before with H because uh, we hadn't arranged it so that the limit was zero. If you look at the definition of derivative, it usually reads F prime of F prime at A is equal to something, something, something. And it's over H. You can't have it that way. If you were to put the F prime of A inside and say the limit is zero, then, then because the limit is zero, you could make it absolute value. Yes? Why else is the case that H was a vector multi? Well, this is another problem, yeah. <laughs> but even when you were dealing with functions with signature reals to reals, you, absolute value, you, we couldn't swing it until we made the definition look like this, with one side as zero. Yes? Why is a function of ti and ti? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> no good reason. It should be. Right? So this is h. This is h. So <laughs> we, I have to be giving... I have to be giving f the same increment that I'm giving to h. So all, all of this, all of these three have a missing t. So the thing that was missing was this t here, t, ei, t, ei. Okay, good. So, f of a plus t ei minus f of a minus m of t ei equal to zero. So, what did I do from this step to this step. <coughs> Remove the absolute value. And in the end, why is, why is this going to be acceptable? Because the right-hand side is zero. Yes? Um, why can we not just make this as t goes to zero since t is um, every e on? Oh, then we have vector. <coughs> okay, good. So, <coughs> so now, uh, the derivative exists, and, and it is m. And in particular, that means we were able to solve for m, and m is linear. m is linear. So what are the two properties that linearity gives you? They're two separate names. Homogeneity, additivity. So I want to get this t free from m. Can I get it free? Yeah, homogeneity lets, lets the t come out. T <clears throat> and then minus the T has come out now M E I. Okay, now what? Can you see it? We're starting to get very close to the answer. I'm sorry? F is not linear. Mm hmm Do what? Yeah. So have a look. Let's distribute the T. Let's, the 1 over T, I mean to say. Let's distribute the 1 over T in. And then we have what? The limit as T, E, I, goes to 0 of, now this will be F of A, plus T E I minus F of A and then over T that's what that one is and then separately I'm going to write minus M of E I equal to zero now we're getting very close so in particular the limit symbol the thing that's moving the thing that's moving is T right so how about this? Is this moving at all? No. It's not. It's a constant. 
which means it can come outside of the limit, can't it? <coughs> so, this is the limit. STEI goes to zero of f of a plus TEI minus f of a over T and then is equal to M E I. And this limit must exist because by hypothesis it exists. And because it exists by hypothesis, we have a name for this, actually. What is this? This is the ith partial derivative of f. That's what it is. So this is dif at a. That's what the left-hand side is. And this is, well, there's no better way to write it, just like this. But in plain language, this is the ith column of, and remember, we've been writing m, but what is m? The derivative of f at a. <clears throat> so of course, what we've, what we've done is we've said that, that, that the ith column of the derivative is the column of partial derivatives. The, the, I, the, the, the column of partial derivative with respect to ith variable, but the Jacobian is just the matrix that you obtain when you put all those columns all in a row. Does that make sense? When you put them all side by side. <laughs> so we've shown it. The derivative agrees with the Jacobian when the derivative exists. So this raises a, 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 a concern because the statement is when the derivative exists, the matrix of the derivative is the Jacobian. So what, what concern is there? Right. What if, you can, what if you can compute the Jacobian? Does that mean that the derivative does exist? <laughs> and the answer is no. So the converse of this result is false, and that'll be the topic of, of an exercise. So that is to say, the Jacobian exists, does not imply that the derivative exists. You have to get a little wild to make it work, to, to, to produce such an example. And it'll be we won't deal with those examples a, a great deal, but we'll just we'll do one just so you can see that yeah. You can you can break it. Yes. Would a simple example be if uh, a Jacobian had a zero column? I don't know of any simple example. So so let me let me give you a I'll give you the simplest example I can possibly explain because I don't have a drawing of it. Uh, so imagine, imagine that you've got um, a cone. And I'm not talking about the fact that the derivative of the surface of a cone doesn't exist. I just want you to imagine that I'm balancing something on the tip of that cone. <clears throat> okay, so imagine that, I, imagine that I draw a line like this, and then I, so that's, you know, maybe going exactly left and right, and then now maybe I turn a little bit and I choose a different line. And so if we were to stick with just those lines, then we could fit a plane to that, a plane that would, that would contain the red and also the green line. There, there'd be a plane that would do it. Okay, but now what I want you to imagine is what if I take a third line that, that's not coplanar with those two and, and put it through the same point. So it's, I can't really draw it. But 
you can just you can imagine taking a taking a line and spinning it around and wiggling it like this. You get a whole bunch of lines that are uh, not all coplanar. Well, the derivative at the point where you're putting them all together won't exist, even though you can approach along any line and the and the derivative is constant in <laughs> along a line. Okay, so we'll we'll do one of those for for an exercise. Okay. Yes. Yes. Ah, the derivative is unique because uh, because given because every linear function has a unique matrix. So w we we said that it that it exists that a linear function exists. There's only one matrix for any given linear function. So the uniqueness is a result from linear algebra. It means that for every, so if you consider the individual component functions, so there would have to be m of them, m component functions, and then there's n variables. That means for, for every component function, for every variable, the partial derivative exists. But the existence of all those m times n partial derivatives does not imply the existence of <laughs> the derivative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fun. So another definition. <coughs> which you probably knew more or less from 24, 15, and 19. This is the definition of directional derivative. So again with the same prelude, let u a subset of Rn be open. Let a be an element of u let f be a function from u to rm. And now we need one more thing to add to the prelude. Let v be an element of rn. So to compute the partial derivative, to compute partial derivative, what we, what we did is we said for, for such a function from rn to rm, there are n, what's the, what's the phonetic word, the phonetic thing that goes with n? November. There are November, thank you. There are November uh, partial derivatives. Okay, and we numbered them by the, the names of the standard basis vector, right? The first partial derivative with first basis vector, second with the second basis vector, third with the third basis vector, etc. What the directional derivative is saying, what its motivation is that, well, what's so special about basis vectors? What if I've got some vector that's not a basis vector and I want to do that? Okay, so the directional derivative is saying, well, okay, then fine. You pick your, your favorite one, and we'll do it in that direction. So <clears throat> the directional derivative <coughs> of f at a in direction v is the limit as t goes to 0. Let's make sure I agree with the book here. The book uses h, so h goes to 0 of f of a plus hv minus f of a over h. OK. if this limit exists. So what I want you to observe from this is that if we replaced v with a basis vector, this would be exactly the definition of partial, of, of partial derivative. It would be exactly the same. So when, this, when it exists, it is denoted as this. So it's the partial symbol, but written big. 
with a subscript v and then f at a. Okay, so some notable differences and departures from what you may have previously known as the, as the directional derivative. In particular, we're not going to make any requirement on the size of v. Okay, so v, for all we care, could be, could be the zero vector. So in the particular case of the direction v, what's the directional derivative? Zero. zero. <laughs> okay, fine. So one, one difference is that, is that um, your, your previous definition of the directional derivative might have required that the <laughs> direction is, is, is a unit vector. That, that's a pretty common requirement, but we make no such requirement here. Okay, we're going to make no such requirement here because what I want you to look at is that there are, there are two arguments here. There's the place where we're computing the directional derivative, that's A, and then there's the direction in which we're computing it. The direction in which we're, we're computing it. So if we consider this expression not as a function of A, if we hold A fixed, but rather we, hold, we, we start moving around V, that's to say we've chosen our graph that we're connected to and the specific point we're connected to, but now we're saying we're fiddling around with the direction we might travel. We're fiddling around with V. And how does this behave as a function of V? Does it behave as a function of V? Okay, so in particular, we'll be, we'll be really interested in when is the directional derivative, when regarded as a function of V, when is it homogeneous? When would you be able to put a T here and then factor it out? And the answer, it's an interesting question. And then when would it be, when would this be additive? as a function of v. That is to say, if you had two vectors, v and w, and you added them together and computed the directional derivative in the direction of v plus w, would that be the same as the directional derivative in the direction of v plus the directional derivative in the direction of, of w? And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> the answer is sometimes. Okay, so the, ans the exact answer to, to uh, when is the directional derivative homogeneous and additive with regard to the direction is the following proposition. Uh, it is that <clears throat> the same standard prelude let u be open a in u f from u to rm V and Rn. So same prelude as before. The primary answer to the question I was talking about is the following. <clears throat> if the derivative of f at a, that is to say the derivative of f at a with capital D, if this exists, Then, two things. First, the directional derivative exists. So the existence of the derivative implies the, the existence of every directional derivative. So if, if a function is differentiable at a point, it's, di it's directionally differentiable in every direction. And furthermore, the formula to compute the directional derivative is, is trivial. It is the matrix of f, the matrix of the derivative of f at a multiplied by v. Ah, nice. So, so this is a matrix, okay, and then multiplication by a vector, is that, is that homogeneous? Yes. Is it additive? Yes, because multiplication by a matrix is linear. So when the derivative exists, when the derivative exists, that means that, that means that the directional derivative will be homogeneous and additive in the direction. Very interesting. So let's have an example of this. So any questions before we do an example? This is okay. Okay. 
So probably new, new page. So how about um, <clears throat> how about f of x and y is equal to say 3x squared y plus 2x divided by 5x minus 4y. So in the first place, please compute the derivative of this function. So what will be the shape? Well, so what specifically I mean is, so there's a, there's a couple questions we all need to make, <coughs> make clear. And that is that, does the derivative exist? It does. Okay, we haven't really been real clear about why exactly it does, but I think you can give me a good reason why it does exist. Right. All the, this is a polynomial in x and y. That's a polynomial in x and y. It doesn't get better than polynomials. Okay. More, more or less, that's the reason why the derivative exists. So you, you could go about computing the derivative using that definition, the limit definition, but there's a much far more expedient way. And what is that? The Jacobian, because, because since the derivative exists, it must agree with the Jacobian. OK, so now that we have all those disclaimers out of the way, what will be the shape, the, the rows and columns of the, of the matrix? Two by two, right? It's two by two because this takes, this takes vectors of, of two components and produces vectors of two components. Okay. What will go... So we'll, we'll organize the work in columns. What goes in the first column? So, I mean, not, not form, not, don't pronounce for me formulas, but conceptually, what goes in the first column? Partial derivatives with respect to x. That's what goes in the first column. And what goes in the second? Thank you. So then this would be, what, 6xy plus 2. Uh, and then 5. And then in this one, it would be 3x squared, negative 4. OK. So now I want you to compute 2. I want you to compute the directional derivative in the direction of, in the direction v, uh, of, of f at x and y, where v is something terrific, like uh, I don't know, three negative one. So what is it that I'm asking you to do? Yeah, multiply that matrix by that vector. That, in, in, in the end, this is, this is the request I'm making of you. OK, fine. So six. Six x y plus two, five. Three x squared, negative four. Three, negative one. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, I think I think this is the first time we've multiplied a matrix in this class. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> okay. So what would uh, what kind of result will will come of this? Will it be It'll be a column, right? It'll be a column because this is, uh, what's the shape of this one? The, the vector. 
2 by 1. And then what's this one? 2 by 2. So as a result, it ought to be 2 by 1, the outside ones. Okay. <clears throat> so then that would be what? 18xy. Uh, plus 6, and then minus 3x squared. So that's the first row, <laughs> the first component. And then, uh, okay, this one's easy. So 15 plus 4 is 19. Okay, good. Any question about this one? So here's one that'll be interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting if I could produce for you a function that has a directional derivative in every direction, but no derivative? <laughs> mm, yeah. It'll be exactly that one, the wobbly line that will do it. OK, good. Uh, any question about this? A, a directional derivative in every in every direction, but but no derivative. That means that fa fancy d, you could do that one, but you can't do that one. The the wobbly line thing that I was talking about before, when you put multiple lines passing through a single point. Yes. Is that to say if the Jacobian matrix is a directional matrix? Sorry, I didn't understand that. If the Jacobian uh, matrix exists, does a directional derivative exist or a directional derivative? Ah, so so the question is is if if the Jacobian exists, does the directional derivative exist there? And off the top of my head, I'm going to have to say no. So the reason is because the reason is because uh, what what you're for, for the derivative to exist, it, what, it, what that's saying is that in the first place, you surely should be able to find all the partial derivatives. And just like, just like the standard basis is called a basis because you can take any vector v and say you need this much of the first vector and that much of the second vector and that much of the third vector, et cetera, to, and add them all up to get v, and there's just one way you can do it. Every vector is a linear combination of the basis. For the derivative to exist is saying that that kind of extrapolation is possible. It's saying that, that even, if you're, even if you're choosing to move around in a direction that's not one of the basis directions, it's, you can extrapolate from the basis directions to figure out what it is. So the existence of the Jacobian is saying that, that you, can, you can differentiate in the direction of the basis vectors. For the derivative to exist says furthermore, you can extrapolate to any non-basis vector from just these. And for that reason, no. If, if the Jacobian exists, this does not imply that the directional derivative exists. Uh, unless you happen to be specifically asking about a basis direction. Thank you. Yes? Right. One, yes. So really, this is just combining the two different basis directional derivatives into a. We're kind of just like averaging them to a third one. Is that a correct way of thinking? About yeah, this? but but maybe a, maybe a better word would be would be say finding a linear combination. Yeah, linear combination is what I was going to say, but I didn't know if that would be. Correct. Yeah, it, that that's the right thing to say. Okay. Is that is that the the Jacob if if the derivative exists, then that's saying that all directions can be found as linear combinations, extrapolations of, of just the ones from the basis vectors. Yeah. Yes? Does this make derivative uh, Multilinear. Uh, well, it only has one argument. 
So, so let, let's, let's address that question. If the derivative exists, if you have a function that goes from Rn to Rm, and you have a derivative, then the derivative must also map from Rn to Rn, which is to say, suppose that we have a fixed A, and that df at A exists, then what, what this means is that df at A is also a map from Rn to Rm. Because remember, you know, we're, this, is, this is the worldview like saying, if there's a little creature walking around on the surface and the derivative exists where they are, then if we were all powerful, we should be able to switch the surface for the derivative and they couldn't tell. So the derivative's got to do the same thing that the function does. And the way that it does it is it takes an increment that it, you can think of that like a small step that the creature might take and maps it to the derivative of f at a, the matrix of it, multiplied by that increment. I take a step to the right and the way that the surface seems to change to me is exactly the derivative multiplied by how I stepped. So bec for that reason, the derivative really only has one argument. So I'm not sure how to respond to if, if the derivative is multilinear. Because you, you need multiple arguments to do that. OK. So now, the Jacobian is great in, in many cases, but it's not the best thing in, in all cases. So in particular, I want you to consider the following. Let's cons go back to simpler times and consider this function. And I'm not, I'm not doing any tricks. I'm saying, yes, let's consider the parabola. OK. <clears throat> now, if, let's compute its derivative. And let's just do it, just quote it. So what is it? <laughs> 2x. But do understand what this means. It means that let's fix an x for a moment. Let's fix a specific x, and then let's wander around. Let's make a small increment a few steps away from that x. And the name that we give to the step away from that x is h, right? the little incremental part. So what, this, what I want you to imagine this as is the derivative is something that takes h and then multiplies it by 2x. That's what the derivative actually does. You give it an h, it multiplies it by 2x. This is linear. This is a linear function in h. It's homogeneous and additive in h. And if you were to draw it, And if we were to fix a specific x, say this x, <coughs> and we hold that fixed, and then creatures walking around on the red world, and we re and what we claim is that we're able to replace it with the blue world and creature would never know that we did it. What this is saying is that if you were here and you took a step in that way and the step that you took was h, you moved over a little bit to right there, then your new position, that, that change would be 2xh. That's how much you move in the blue world versus the red world. OK. So the squaring function, when you consider, when you make the consideration about what the derivative does to an increment, this is what it does to an increment. Uh, this will allow us to, to, to compute a derivative of a function that would be otherwise nearly impossible to do. OK. 
So I want you to keep 2xh in mind for, for a moment. So let's consider the function Consider the function f from the set of matrices that are n by n to the set of matrices that are n by n. So I'm talking about square matrices. I want a, I want a function that takes, a, that's a, that takes a, a, a square matrix input and produces a square matrix output. So how many real numbers are we talking about here? n squared and n squared. So in principle, we could, we could imagine this as a function which maps r n squared to r n squared. Like you could take all of the columns of the matrix, say, and then just, just stack them up into one long, very tall column. Okay, so we could, we could do that. Uh, what I want you, the, the formula for the function that I want you to consider is this one, is that you take f and you give it uh, square matrix A, and what it does is it squares the matrix. Of course, that's a permissible operation because the matrices are square. So, so it, it makes sense to square a square matrix, which is kind of funny to say. And what I want to know is what is the derivative of this function? And you'd kind of hope that it would look like, you'd kind of hope that it would look like 2AH. Right, by analogy to the previous page, right? Because, because, after all, a scalar is a square matrix, a one-by-one one matrix. So, so, maybe this one will also look like 2xh. Okay, now, one way you could do this, <laughs> one way you could do this, try and do this with the Jacobian, is that you could, you could, name all the variables, right? You could have a variable 1, 1, a variable 1, 2, a variable 1, 3, variable 1, 4, all the way to 1, n, and then, and then uh, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, all the way to n, 1. So you'd have, <laughs> you'd have a whole bunch of variables. Then you'd have to very carefully multiply them all out. Right? Wouldn't that be terrific? Yeah, it wouldn't. It'd be terrible. But you could do it. Okay, then you could very carefully ca calculate partial derivatives of all these, of all these things. It, it's a nightmare to do. So let's not do that. Let's not do that and let's instead appeal to the definition. Let's appeal to the definition of, de of derivative. So Jacobian would be a nightmare, would be, I'll just say bad would be bad. Uh, let's use the definition. So in particular, we'll, one part of it is that we're going to need to compute f of a plus h minus f of a, where h is some increment in the matrix direction. This is yet another reason why it's not so excellent to try and use dot products, because what would that mean? <laughs> the angle between two matrices, unclear. So, so let's calculate this out. So because what F does is it squares its argument, this would be A plus H all squared minus A squared. Now we want to foil out that, that thing, but now you need to be very careful. So let's foil it out. What will it be? A squared. plus AH plus HA plus H squared. And now, why do I say you have to be very careful? Because those don't commute, do they? That's not 2AH or 2HA, because matrix product doesn't commute. Scalar product commutes, so that would be, when, when this is scalar, that would be twice AH, but it's not now. So we could cancel uh, the a squareds to get uh, ah plus ha plus h squared. So now, here comes one of the one of the one of the fundamental tricks 
to figuring out the derivative of functions which, <coughs> which are not playing nice with Jacobian. What you want to find is you want to compute something like this. This is called the increment of the function. It's, it's how much the function changes when you, when you cause a small step in that direction. And you want to look, find all the terms that have H's in them, that have H's in them, uh, and, <coughs> pardon me, and they're of degree at most one. Of degree at most one. So, so notice that this one has an H in it, and it ha this term that I'm pointing to has exactly one H in it. And this one also has exactly one H in it. But this one, this is H squared. So this one is quadratic in H. So as a result, it's going to more or less be excluded from, from the computation. So here's our guess. For the derivative of, uh, for the derivative of f, it is going to be just this part, the part that could possibly be linear, that, that is linear in h. So that's going to be our guess. And let's see if we can actually plug this into the, the definition of derivative and make it work. So let's compute the limit as h goes to, now, h is a matrix. So h is going to have to go to 0 something, right? The 0 matrix. Right? It's not going to 0 as a, as a scalar. It's not going to 0 as a vector. It's going to 0 as a matrix. So how do you write this, the 0 matrix? Yeah, 0 with brackets around it. So H is going to the, the matrix which has zeros in every position. So then this would be 1 over H. But of course, this is H like this. And this is now, <laughs> is this absolute value? No. Is this, uh, is this vector length? No, it's, sur it's surely not determinant. <laughs> this is the matrix square norm. Yeah, that one, where you take all of the components, square them, all that, blah, blah. Okay. So, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, here we are. So, now we want to do that. F of A plus H minus F of A, A. And then minus, here's our, here's our candidate, AH plus HA. And we want to show that this is equal to zero. Uh, the zero, what, so what kind of zero does it need to be? Zero matrix, right? <clears throat> okay, well, we established, we established that uh, this is that. And then if we subtract that part away, that means what, <coughs> what does end up being left inside of the big round parentheses? H squared. H squared. So this will be the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h, and then what's in here is h squared equal to 0. Okay, that's what we'd like to show. We want to show that. Now, in, in, in brief passing, so let, let me ask for a moment. If you just suspend your disbelief for a moment and, and let big H represent a scalar, a scalar value. Then H squared and then H squared over H, would that go to zero or would it not if H were scalar? It would, right? In the same way that X squared over X goes to zero as X goes to zero, because you could cancel some X's and then you'd have another X and then that would go to zero. Okay, now, this, <coughs> will go to zero exactly when we can do the following. The limit as h goes to zero, one over h multiplied by the norm of h. And this now will be going to what? Scalar zero. Right, because we're now we're asking now we're asking for something even more. Let's make let's make not just the matrix go to zero. Let's make 
even its norm go to zero. So now another matter is that what is true about matrix norms when, when they're squaring? So specifically, I'm about to invoke something that is not usually covered in linear algebra. And that is, suppose we have two matrices, B and C. And suppose that I want to take them outside of the norm and do this. And how are, how are these two related to each other? Other way around. <laughs> Other way around. Uh, less or equal. Okay, so then this doesn't really matter so much for our class because we won't get in, into it too much, but this is called the submultiplicativity of matrix norms. <laughs> Can you believe that? Submultiplicativity. Well, that means that this, what a name, this, 1 over h, on the one hand has to be greater than or equal to 0 because all the terms are non-negative. And on the other hand, has to be less, uh, less or equal to this one. So this one, and then I could factor this out and write, well, let's do it like this. So this inequality is due to the submultiplicativity of the matrix norm. And now one of these cancels, the other one, right? And then we have one more. So what's ha going to happen? It goes to zero. So what does that mean? So that's all nice and fun, but what I want you to see from this is the following. Is that, therefore, the derivative of the matrix squaring function uh, is this function is the function that takes h and produces a h plus h a and now here's my challenge to you please try and write this in a sensible way but without h it's surely not 2a so what I want you to see is that when you compare this to the scalar case, in the first place, you could write sensibly, you could write AH plus HA in the scalar case. That would make sense, and it would still be this. But also in the scalar case, it makes sense to write that the derivative of F at A is, twi is twice A. But now, in the case with matrices, it doesn't really make sense to consider the derivative unless you're showing how it acts on an increment. It doesn't really make sense to consider its formula. And this is going to be a recurring theme, and it's going to hit hard on Tuesday, okay, where you, we, won't be able to, we won't be able to represent how the derivative acts except by showing how it acts on increments. OK, so I think we're out of time. Yeah. So have a nice uh, whatever day it is.